12. <laughs> <laughs> Finally to 12. 12 steps. I am grateful for the realization that the cause of my upset, which I thought was in the world, was actually only an unquestioned belief and decision in my mind. I have decided anew for my peace of mind. Yay! <laughs> You could have had a little thing at the bottom there for, you know, if not, yeah. <laughs> go back to right. step, step one. If you don't say yay, <laughs> if you don't feel grateful, feel like saying yay, pull out another worksheet. Yeah. I was suggesting during the break to um, Lynette that, that very thing. You know that if you get down to ten, and you and you notice that you really would rather hang on to your expectation than to let it go in favor of peace, then there's probably more work that mm -hmm. will have to be done yeah. before you see it clearly enough and feel the desire for peace enough that you're willing to let it go. There may be another lack, or there may be something more in there that I'm not seeing. Or the next thing, like, you know, when Lynette mentioned something about, oh, but if I do this, how will I save face? Yeah. I mean, I, there's something in there that you probably would find it helpful to work with, because there's some scenario coming up in the mind, probably, there must be, that you look at and you say, oh my gosh, I would be so embarrassed, or I would feel so... No, you know, I, and I think about that too. I can't figure out why I use those words because I can't. I I think it goes back to a power thing, a control thing. Mm -hmm. I really do. But uh, your suggestion is good. My biggest fear is the next family gathering is going to come before I work through it. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to explode. And that, you know? that's when you you pray. Yeah. You don't pray for Nancy to change. You pray for the Holy Spirit to guide you through the situation for peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you ask. I was sharing the, the uh, analogy that you often use, David, of the overhead projector and how the, the beliefs would be analogous to all the transparencies that could be stacked up on top of that brilliant light in the overhead projector to such an extent that what's, what you see out on the screen is, is quite dark and there's not much light to it. And I, you know, symbolically for me, every time I do one of these instruments for peace, I'm pulling one of the transparencies off of the overhead projector. Letting a little more light Letting shine Letting a little through. more light shine through. <laughs> And, and the whole object being to get them all out of the way so that all that's left is only light. That's another motivation for, for and, and even for doing this, because it, it can be one more, you know, I mean, how many workshops have you been to where you mm -hmm. filled out worksheets and stuff? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like, well, there was a lot of motivation to get through it because it was like I could see that there was actually some light <laughs> mm -hmm. on the other it. side. And it may take a few. I mean, we were talking about this just the other night, how, you know, if you do the first three or four or five and, and you still feel like, yeah, you know, what's the point? It's kind of like the workbook in the sense that you have to do, you just have to keep doing it. Even though you don't quite see <coughs> where it's going yet, and even though you don't quite have the experience yet that would reinforce it in your own mind and want and, and have the mind want to do it, mm -hmm. it's like in the introduction to the workbook, Jesus says, you know, you're going to not be real crazy about these lessons, um, and you're going to actively resist them, and you're not going to understand them all, but that's okay. Just do them. And at some point, your experience of doing them will be such that you will see the value in them. And I, I feel the same is very much the case with these instruments for peace. Just keep doing it and you will see the value in it at some point. Another suggestion is to start with seemingly small things and work that aren't such babies. Yeah, work your way up to some of the bigger ones because that way it doesn't seem like such a big thing to mm -hmm. To work through, and you do and, 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 yeah. too. and the principles become clear when I'm not so emotionally invested in this issue. 
um, there's a little more willingness to see it differently than there is when there's something that seems like a really major thing that I'm hanging on to. You know, <coughs> that's a, a good suggestion because, like, again, it's so hard to, to deal with some of those big things. And when you get enough practice with some of those little ones, yeah. you know, um, <coughs> it just makes it so much clearer, I think. A lot of people have said, well, how would this, something like this fit in with like, inner child work? Or suppose they have been seeing a therapist and we've been working on different things and issues. You know, how does this process and how do these things relate with that? And in one sense, a lot of psychotherapy and inner child work or whatever has been uh, trying to get in touch with memories and go back into your childhood and in earlier parts of your life. And a lot of times that's a very helpful thing in the sense that to be talking and feeling like you're in a comfortable situation where you can get in touch with some of those. If they've been repressed memories that haven't be, even been allowed into consciousness, that can be really helpful to just let them come up. But then again, it's like, what do you do with the memory when it comes up, <coughs> if it's been repressed? And that's where the Course is so helpful. And it's, the Course is saying, you need to change your perception of that. And again, w what produces the perception? The beliefs. That's why the Course is so helpful in tracing it down and really getting at the underpinnings of the beliefs mm -hmm. instead of trying to like redo scenes or, um, you know, do blame. or blame or, or even in some cases confront the, the <coughs> thinking of just going back and... Or throw stones at the house. I was just thinking about Jenny and, and Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Because it seems she to be therapeutic of, of, yeah. of screaming, yelling, mm -hmm. beating something, throwing stones at something, or or the idea of even confronting. Go back, you know, to your father, to your mother, to your siblings, or whatever. The, the real change has to come from a change in perception, and that has, means you have to get to the belief. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much in, in just going back into childhood or to the past, but it's really looking mm -hmm. at your mind. <coughs> but, but isn't it too? that a lot of that work that, that happens with those memories, usually the child feels that it's their fault and a lot of other things. And again, it's a change in that perception yeah. that, you know, <coughs> you know, you weren't responsible for that, you know, and, and, and again, changing that perception. Yeah, inner child work ultimately is not to place blame on anyone. Yeah. It's to come to peace. But you know, sometimes it doesn't work through everything as deep as this, and, and ultimately you really need to, or you'll be continuing inner child work for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. or holding a teddy bear in your bedroom for the rest of your life, and going for the teddy bear, because mm -hmm. that's what you do. It's a great idea to not have any blame, but again, only that true forgiveness that you were talking about, and that, as you were saying, has to be very carefully learned, yeah. because if you really believe that it really happened to you, then there's a lot of anger and whatever because in a sense the mind feels that it truly was victimized mm -hmm. by whatever. And you know, you, you want to try to move towards no blame, but as long as the mind believes in the reality of the memory, then there can't... There's a part in here where Jesus is, this is absence of publicity and where he's talking to Helen and Bill and uh, it really is touching on what we're talking about, about letting go of the past. And he says, uh, he's talking about these notes, which is the Course in Miracles. He referred to them as these notes. He says to Helen, these notes are part of your life work, and I will treat them with respect. It is true that this will lead to something quite different because the notes point only to the future. They lead to a future that you will know. There was a past but it does not matter. It does not explain the present or account for the future. You both went over your childhood in some detail and at considerable expense, and it merely encouraged your egos to become more tolerable to you. I would hardly want you to repeat that same error. Knowledge is not won through curiosity, which is an ego attribute. Knowledge can be found only if it is sought to give it to someone else. This means that you are ready to appreciate its real value and have already accepted its worth for yourself. 
that is what that is what I meant when I told you you cannot go to God with Bill, but you can go for him and bring knowledge back to him. If this is in the future, going to God, why would you care at all about the past, except to the extent that your ego objects to your rightful destiny? Are you interested in healing insanity or in studying its past? <laughs> that is of concern only if you believe that something that could remedy it happened in the past. Even my personal history is of no value to you except as it teaches you that I can help you now. That's quite a statement of all the, the whole teachings that are in the Bible. He's saying it's of no value and except that it can teach you that I can help you now. That there's this living presence that's available to you. But no history of irreconcilable viewpoints is helpful in establishing truth. The spirit has no history, being the same yesterday, today, and always. The history of a split mind is not a constructive focus for those who are being trained in an integrated and true concept of themselves. I am quite willing to take your question up again when it no longer is of any interest to your egos and if it is of help to someone else. Otherwise, it would be much better to <coughs> devote yourself to knowing God. Very <laughs> disappointing. That's right to the point. And to me, that's been the thing as I've gone along. It's been, wow. I heard Christian Murdy say this one time, too, that there's no value in the past. There's none. A lot of times people think, well, there are some important things <laughs> that I've learned, but Jesus said it so clearly there where he said, the only, if you thought that there was a remedy in the past, then it would make good sense to go searching in the past. You know, Freudian psychoanalysis always thought, you know, your childhood, you know, situations and memories and everything determine who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's been, there's been a lot of variations of that same thing, but Jesus is saying, don't go hunting in the past for the remedy, because even behavior mod, which would be the whole other mm -hmm. end of the spectrum, behavior modification is dealing with the screen, and the Course is teaching again that the screen is the past. Mm -hmm. so even if you're trying to tinker with the screen and leaving out all these supposedly urges and uncontrollable heads and <laughs> you know, all the things that, that Troy talked about, even if you just talk about modifying behavior, it's still trying to tinker with the past instead of coming to the present. Pretty radical. This is a radical new therapy. <laughs> Are there specific questions or topics? I mean, there's a lot of things we can go <coughs> to. Yeah. I <laughs> uh, just want to touch on what we're going into this thing on no compromise because, again, you know, we were talking the other day about, you know, I forget which part it is, none that I would keep, you know, whether that's thoughts or whatever. Um, and um, what does that mean, no compromise? But to me, I've looked at it real closely in the Course, and the Course says salvation is no compromise of any kind, and I was just reading a section today where he was saying to believe that salvation involves compromise is to believe that, that love is, is, is attack which is kind of a pretty strong statement. But, but any compromise attempt in the world, it, there are many, many, many forms of attack that the mind doesn't recognize as attack. So it has to be gone to very carefully to get down to the, to the bottom of it. The non-compromise comes in in the sense that there's these two thought systems in the mind, and any attempt to reconcile the two or to choose the ego or even in a sense, to, there's a lot of delay maneuvers to coming to accept the atonement, you know, in the moment. That all of that would be a compromise attempt. It would be kind of like trying to, trying to strike a balance between eternal, changeless, abstract love and the projected world of form. And even the attempts to try to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, which is kind of a very helpful metaphor for many people, that when you really